speaker is Dimitri Simberg from the University of Colorado in Denver. Dimitri, ready? Okay, so. Okay, that's a laser, yeah? Okay, so uh, thanks everyone for uh, coming to this interesting and quite controversial session, I think, and, and uh, it's uh, kind of hard to reconcile different things that we heard here, but um, uh, I'll try to show my, uh, my perspective on these things, and, and, and particularly on the mechanisms, how nanoparticles activate complement, and I, and I, and I really think that it's, it's an important issue, and we have to uh, be careful if uh, the particles activate complement, whether we want to proceed with the clinical uh, testing of these particles. So um, uh, um, I guess uh, that's the way forward, yeah. So uh, the particles uh, we've been working with, is, 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 it's similar to the uh, particles that uh, were removed from uh, the clinical use. Uh, MRI contrast agents, uh, dextran iron oxide nanoparticle. They're prepared by co-precipitation method. And uh, uh, pretty straightforward method. You can make a very, very large scales of uh, uh, pharmaceutical product, which is actually the reason why these particles made into the clinical use, and particularly this method of uh, synthesis. So uh, they, we call them nanoworms. Uh, they, uh, uh, the, the, in, by, on TM, they look like worms uh, anyway, but uh, if we do the, uh, 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 like, look at the overall shape of the particles, they look more as spherical uh, particles. Um, so the, the iron oxide, that something you see on TM is the core itself. That's what makes the particle magnetic and MRI contrast agent. And the surface is all coated with the dextran shell. There's about 500 dextran chains per particle. Uh, a pretty significant number, so it looks really like a, a caterpillar. It's not a, um, maybe we should change the uh, name for these particles uh, through the nano caterpillars. Um, and uh, uh, and we'll, we, we, we really know that the complement plays a role in the nanoparticle uh, clearance, and, uh, and, and this simple experiment can uh, demonstrate that. If we inject these nanoworms into the wild-type mice, uh, which uh, blue bars, uh, we see plenty of uptake by circulating uh, leukocytes, neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes, and uh, if we inject the same particles in the complement deficient mice, we almost get no, uh, no uptake, no immune uptake. So it's definitely uh, an important observation that we see the same thing in human blood. If we block complement activation, we don't get the uptake of these particles by uh, any of those immune cell types. So here we ask what are the mechanisms of complement activation of these particles, even more importantly, what is the mechanism of opsonization of these particles that would primes them for the leukocyte and immune cell uptake? So, uh, and I was really hoping that uh, someone will walk through complement activation scheme. That didn't happen, so I probably have to uh, take a task, this task and explain you a little bit about the complement activation mechanism. So, uh, so uh, in human, in mice, it's, uh, the pathways are similar, but still there are differences. So. In, in overall, uh, there, is, uh, there are three pathways by which uh, complement can be activated. It's a lectin pathway that recognizes sugars. It's a classical pathway that recognizes antibody-coated pathogens and the alternative pathway. So, and uh, as you see here, the particles uh, activate uh, uh, in human serum under right conditions uh, with the, uh, un uh, by alternative pathway. So the alternative pathway is, uh, is the, I would say it's the main pathway of the um, complement activation in humans. And, and the reason being is that this factor, uh, component C3B, is spontaneously, almost spontaneously generated in human serum or human blood, and it covers whatever foreign surface it encounters. So the same happens with our particles. Once we have initial amount of C3B deposited on the surface, then the factor B that becomes activated too and propertyene 
bind together and form something called alternative pathway convertase. So this convertase starts cleaving serum C3 into additional C3B molecules. And those C3B covalently bind to the foreign surface. So if we use, uh, that's a background complement activation, if we use the antipropidine antibody that blocks the binding of propidine, which is a critical uh, stabilizer of this complex, we don't get complement activation. This is basically an indication that the particles activate through the alternative pathway. So remember, again, in humans, the alternative pathway is always turned on, and this thing is spontaneously, excuse me, spontaneously is formed uh, and spontaneously added to the surface. So, uh, uh, so if that's the case, if we have the CC3B that's adding to the, to the surface, maybe we can just prevent the, the addition of C3B to the particles. So uh, if we look at the C3B structure, C3B, once it forms, it has a, a very uh, chemical reactive group in its active uh, center. It's called thioester. So the thioester forms covalent bonds either with, either with hydroxyl group or with the amino groups on the pathogen surface. And the result of this interaction, we have either amide bond or uh, es uh, ester bond. With the, with the, between C3B and whatever foreign surface. So it's a covalent bond. So the question was, can we just prevent this covalent bond? Our nanoparticles are dextran iron oxide. We have plenty of this hydroxyl group on the particle surface. What if we just chemically block all the hydroxyls on the particle surface? Will we prevent the binding of this complement C3B factor? And, and it turns out it doesn't. So, uh, when we uh, use a variety of chemistries, and I show only some of them, we either accumulate or oscillate those hydroxyl group on the particles, that doesn't change the result. The particles always activate complement in human serum, and they always become zopsinized. So at this point, we started to think that maybe the C3B doesn't bind really to the dextran to the nanoparticle surface. So what else is on the particle surface? It's a serum protein corona that sticks to the nanoparticle. So maybe these proteins provide a scaffold for binding of these uh, serum proteins. And here we did one interesting experiment where we took our particles, either naked particles, or we precode these particles with a, a serum deficient for complement. So every protein is there in the corona, but except the complement proteins. And then we added purified factors of the alternative pathway of complement. And we look at how much C3 is deposited in the particles. So this is how much C3 is deposited in serum, and this is how much is added if we precode the particles with serum proteins and then added alternative pathway factors. And this is how much is added to the naked particles. So you see, there is really dramatic difference. So we do really need serum coating on the particle surface in order to trigger this binding of C3 to the particles. So, uh, and then we did uh, additional experiments, and we actually realized that C3 indeed binds to the serum protein corona on the particles. When we incubate the particles with serum and then eluted the particles and the uh, serum proteins under gentle conditions, and we run the non-reducing gel, and if we compare how it runs compared with the native C3 proteins, and you see that the smear, it tells that the C3 actually bind to the high molecular weight component that we eluted from the particle surface, which are serum proteins. So if that's the case, and we know that the proteins stick to the nanoparticle in a very reversible way, there's a kind of concept of soft corona, things come on off, we think that if that's the case, the complement will also come off. And that indeed what happens, so we pre-incubated the particles with serum, and then wash them and incubate it just by shaking and look at how much complement is left. And then we even re-incubate it with fresh serum. So uh, before incubation, we have C3 deposition on the particle surface. After we just shake the nanoparticles, they lost almost all of their C3 on the, on the surface. But then if we incubate, we got a lot more C3 back 
opsonization. So it tells that the really complement activation is very dynamic. So it's never constant on the particle surface because of this protein then come and go. And we hypothesize that the same thing would happen in vivo. If we inject the particles, serum proteins bind, complement binds to it, then the proteins come off and the new proteins come on. So we designed a, a kind of experiment uh, uh, which is, uh, which prove exactly this point. So first we took these particles, pre-coat them with human plasma proteins, and we fluorescently, fluorescently label these proteins. Fluorescently label these proteins, inject into a mouse, recover those particles five minutes later, and these particles are magnetic. It's very easy to recover them from blood, and we compare how much protein is left. We loaded exact same amount of particles, and we see that the proteins were just lost in the circulation. All the protein corona that we pre-coated the particles with were just lost from the circulation. And then we look at the complement, and we got exactly the same thing. We pre-coated with human complement. We had to do with human because we couldn't, uh, and we injected this into the complement deficient mouse because otherwise we'll have cross-reactivity. The antibodies, unfortunately, are very cross-reacting. And what we got, if we inject these particles and recover, them, they had human complement before the injection, but they lost all the human complement after the injections, after we recover them from the blood. And this is just the control where we inject into the mouse, the plain, non-coded particles, and they quickly become coated with mouse complement. So it really tells us how, fa how fast this process and how dynamic this process, where the complement proteins, as well as other coronas, can go on and off in vivo situation, uh, which is, uh, uh, puts in very interesting angle. So just to demonstrate this uh, 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 graphically, this is our particles, and, and red, green, and blue are complement proteins. This is the convertase with property in blue, and factor B, and green is C3B. And, and you see how these proteins are invading the nanoparticle shell, and, and, and basically complement proteins bind to them. So uh, there was kind of an, a study, and then we thought, Okay, then uh, what are these complement uh, proteins bind to and which protein exactly triggers that uh, uh, complement activation? Which serum opsonin triggers the complement activation? And we, uh, um, uh, we, we look at the, uh, many different people and we collected 40 or uh, almost 50 samples of human serum and we saw that there is a huge variability of complement uh, 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 coating of this, uh, in these people. So some people have really huge, almost uh, 20 times higher uh, complement activation than the average. So there is a huge variability in the population uh, of, of different human subjects, which by itself is actually very interesting. But then we look at which protein that uh, complement activation correlates with, and we saw that actually the people who had a lot of C3, they also had a lot of IgG on their surface. So it's really that uh, the person who had a lot of C3 had a lot of IgG, so we thought that maybe IgG does play a role in this, uh, in this process. So uh, we took the particles, we measured complement uh, opsonization of these particles in the normal serum, or we first pre-coated this particle with IgG, just plain IgG, and then added serum, and you see it's dramatically increased complement activation. So it looks like IgG is a very good scaffold. It's just a non-specific IgG that we bought from Jackson, so I don't think it has any reactivity with the particle. It really promotes the complement activation. And here we see that uh, the, uh, if we deplete IgG from serum, you see about threefold decrease in the complement activation, but then if we add a just non-specific IgG back, we got the complement activation back. So it can tell us really that maybe there is a link between how much IgG binds in serum of a certain individual and the complement response so, um, uh, to these nanoparticles. Uh, and uh, with that, I would uh, have three things that uh, take away things. It's the complement uh, protein as, uh, assemble and protein corona that are on particle surface and they dissociate. And IgG is one of the protein that provides this binding sort of 
uh, facilitates at least the complement activation and binding. And there is a, a variability, sometimes very significant in the general population, which is a, an important phenomenon that uh, we sometimes overlook. Um, now, with that, uh, I would like to uh, thank uh, all the people in my lab uh, who did uh, this work, and of course, Moin uh, and, and complement group that we have on our campus, Mike Hollers and Nirmal Banda. Um, uh, who helped me uh, with this complement studies, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. We have time for one short question. Yes. It can be a short question uh, because this session is so confusing. Uh, but my question, Dimitri, is what is the stability of dextran? on iron oxide. Yes, it's quite stable, uh, opposed to what people believe. So if we put this dextran in serum, we can measure the dextran content with anti-dextran antibody. Or if we loot the proteins, the dextran still stay there. There's quite a multivalent uh, hydrogen bonding between the iron oxide core and the dextran. I don't think that comes off. It really, we didn't see any evidence. So uh, the, the reason I'm asking the, uh, the reason I'm asking that question is, in your in vivo studies, if dextran comes off of the iron oxide particles, and anything that binds to dextran is something that you're not going to recover. And so the complement proteins that bind to dextran yeah. from in vivo recovery study that you showed, and yeah. the final conclusion about complement um, is coming off of the particles. It's probably the, just a coating, and then they stay well, with the coating. Well, the, the complement doesn't bind to dextran, so we, we have this data in the supplement. So we can loot the proteins, but we see that the dextran stays there. The dextran stays on the particles. Even after the in vivo injection, we recover the particles, we probe them with anti-dextran antibody, it's exact same on the reactivity. It's really not, it's, it doesn't bind to dextran. Thank you very much, Dimitri, and uh, then the next